Uh, well, I guess we'll start with you, uh, Mary. If you can maybe give us about 60 seconds or so, uh, just a brief background on yourself and why you've chosen to run for this particular department. And obviously, uh, Jennifer will give you the same opportunity to answer as well. Well, I am uh, Mary Perry, of course. I was raised in Arkansas and had to join the military so that I could escape, the, you know, get indoor plumbing. I had indoor plumbing at 10, but you know, not before that. The uh, spent eight and a half years in the Air Force and was stationed here due to my ex-husband. Went to UNLV for both my undergraduate and my law school. I graduated in the charter class. And I am running for Department L because there seems to be quite a bit of problems. There's decisions that's being made that's putting children back in the hands of abusers and, and people who's picking children up drunk. And just, you know, decisions that's being overturned by a poor abuse of discretion. Okay. Jennifer. Well, I think we know why you're running for this particular seat <laughs> as opposed to another, but... Um, I am a marriage and family therapist as well as a lawyer, and in 02 when Department L came open, it was the only seat. There were nine of us, and I ran because I wanted to bring my behavioral science background to the family courts for court improvement, mostly focused at the time on alternative dispute resolution, mediation, and other types of things like cooperative parenting after divorce. This is, if you want to take one and pass along, all the programs that I've created since I've been a judge. and. Um, in response to what Miss Perry said, I've only been reversed three times. One on a three-day notice for uh, failure to take a three-day notice for default on a TPR. One on an insurance issue in my first term. And one on a case where the Supreme Court said, you thought you should have an evidentiary, then you canceled it. Well, you should have had that evidentiary three times, and this is my 12th year. So, I don't know. I do want at this point in time, uh, I, usually I lead with this, I, I do want to make a full disclosure. I, I, I don't have any case, active cases in front of Judge Elliott. I may have one case that's going, at, at basically it's a summary dispo that may have been assigned to you, but I, I don't, I have nothing substantive going on. I haven't seen you in court in a very long time. I don't, it's been a couple of years, I want to say. Um, I do represent uh, a, I don't know, a, a, Putative stepson? Putative stepson, is that the appropriate term? I, I don't know. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, that's pretty, that's pretty good. Um, uh, of, um, of Jennifer's um, on a, a matter wholly unrelated to the family realm. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to do full disclosure. Um, won't have any impact on, on this, but it's just, okay. it's a quasi family relation, but I just wanted to disclose that to everybody. And when um, uh, Mr. Gaudet comes in, well, I'll disclose it to him as well. So. Okay. That having been said, um, we every two years we get the lovely judicial performance evaluations from the RJ, and they're um, and it's really one of the few times that the general public gets somewhat of a, a window into the judges, not only as individuals but also how they rank among their peers. What ideas? And we'll start with Jennifer, and then and go to Mary. We'll just rotate back and forth. What ideas do you have to perhaps improve upon the accuracy of that survey? Uh, and derivatively, what ideas do you have to improve the public's overall image of the judiciary, which has gotten some uh, negative press as of late uh, due to the foibles of some of its members? Over the years, what I believe occurs with the uh, RJ survey is people, It's it's hard to take time out of your day to do stuff like that because attorneys are busy. So it's usually people who, are, who like you a lot or people who are mad at you. And um, do I have any way to improve it? I think they need to have a bigger, uh, wider body of people that are taking it because you know there's less than 300 attorneys a lot of times in the 200s who are responding and even in the 100s, depending on who has taken your survey. Uh, mine has gone down over the years, and I think that's because I've gotten stronger as a judge and less willing to um, entertain arguments that are not based in uh, relative to the facts or uh, they're creative arguments, I like to think about them, but at the same time, you have a heavy docket and you want to move things along case management-wise. So I'm probably not as uh, therapeutic as I was when I first got there. And I think males are not really happy with the with strong females, which is what the RJ 
survey found through, um, I forget who does that. Who, I forget. I forget Down, Down, Downing, Downing Research. Yes. They, and the other thing is, I don't know that they are all that honest because in the first, uh, in this last one, we have a lot of law clerks that are on the third floor who are licensed and not one of them got that survey. Not one. Really? Hmm. And then when they asked for it, they got an email saying, here is your second uh, one to cover them, but they did not send it to anyone. But there was no first. So I'm not sure how they determine, because they say they send it to every licensed attorney, but that's not true. I, I, I know I've gotten them and I've filled them out. I'm, I'm sure, Mary, you have. I haven't gotten them in the really? past four times. That's surprising. You know, huh. The first year or two know. that I was licensed to practice law, I, I got them every time, but I haven't gotten okay. them since then. I think there's there's some. They need to do their due diligence. Yeah. Or, or it may be an over aggressive spam filter. Yeah, you never know. But, <laughs> and I'm sorry, Jennifer. One one thing I had asked a compound question, which you're never supposed to do, but I did anyway. Um, what ideas do you have to perhaps improve the public's impression of the judiciary as a whole? Again, to try and make up for the mistakes or misgivings of some of its members. Well, this is basically the time that we are uh, placed in a position where we can let you know what we've been doing, how, how uh, we are with our case management. So it's nice when people come out and want to find out or will go on your website or try to understand what we judges are doing in the background. For me, um, my case management is in the 300s open caseload and there are judges down there anywhere from 640 open cases down to 340 and I'm usually around 390. So I'm doing a pretty good job that way, but it's hard to tell people that stuff unless, because you're kind of in an isolated position. You're not hanging out with people and discussing anything relative to your job, really. We see you guys in Ely sometimes, but other than election time, that's really when we get to tell you how we're doing and what we've done, which I'm very proud of my record. The, the RJ survey improvements and public's uh, view of the judiciary as a whole. I have to agree with uh, Judge Elliott when it comes to the judiciary survey. I think it's one-sided. They tend to say, okay, who's going to be the ones that's more the most negative and send it out to the people who's going to be most negative on the judges who's there. They do not get out to everybody. I would love to have had the opportunity to fill out the survey. The, one of the problems and one of the complaints that I've heard most while campaigning is that the only time they see the judges or anyone who's interested in being a judge is during the election cycle. What I would want to do is be a little bit more active in the community as, as a sitting judge. Let the people know, hey, do you have any ideas? What kind of job am I doing? Why should I wait every two years for the, you know, for, for the survey to come back and tell me if I'm doing a good job or a bad job? I would like for the attorneys who's appearing in front of me to feel a little, at least comfortable enough to say, you know what, you're really getting stupid. Those are dumb decisions you're making. You may want to look at, at the law. Or, you know, you're doing good, keep up the good work. You know, give me some sort of clue on if I'm doing a good enough job or not. Mary, uh, of the years that you've had, uh, you know, in the trenches, so to speak, in family mm -hmm. court, Obviously, you've noticed some areas of, of inefficiency or areas for improvement. Uh, what do you think is the greatest area of inefficiency in the family court as it is right now? And if elected, what are you going to do to try and remedy that? And obviously, Jennifer will be the same opportunity. I, I think one of and I apologize for the noise in the background. We open the door because it gets really hot in here. Um, with all the hot air coming out of me. Okay. Yeah, we're fine. Okay. And they're cooking. <laughs> we understand that. The, uh, I, th I think one of the biggest areas for the inefficiency is how you have attorneys and proper person litigants appearing at the same time. The attorneys are billing their clients hourly most of the time, and so it's really wasting the, the money that their clients have. So one of the things that I would consider doing, if at all possible, is possibly having a day set aside for when the attorneys are appear appearing, and then a day when there's proper person litigants appearing and seeing if there's any way of striking a balance there and that way I know okay I've got to be a little bit more patient on this day because they don't understand the law as much so there's not going to be the rules that's going to be followed as much and you know and, and just try to work with the public a little bit better and make it to where it's easier for them. Good case management is something that uh, requires proactivity and the first year that I was a judge, or the first term I was a judge, we were 
we couldn't get our caseload below a baseline of open cases between eight and 900. Now we have 20, then we had 12. We only have 16 that are devoted to domestics, but we have a new case management system and it's like a real time case activity report. So if something is filed, it automatically updates. So if you go to that website, I'm able to see how many days each one of my cases has been open by type. So I can get on there and see why is this adoption open for two months? Oh, they don't know to get a setting slip, so I can do a minute order and move my caseload along faster. Additionally, with the CMC requirements, and if they have kids, all uh, without a motion, I'll send out a notice. Uh, here's your mediation order, and you're coming back for a case management conference return from FMC. And usually, we get decrees, many, many decrees on that on those days. I think pro uh, being proactive with regard to your case management is important, and I'm always focused on. Um, improving the system. Right now, I, I keep, continue to manage the truancy diversion program. There are 120,000 truants in our, our county, and I've been involved in this program since 2005, and when I took it over in 07, there were nine schools, and now we're in 38 schools. We have uh, volunteer lawyers who wear robes onto the school campuses, which really is a proactive um, way to address kids that are not engaged in learning and are out on the streets in gangs, having sex, doing drugs. We consider truancy a gateway crime. So I'm heavily involved in that program and will continue to be so until I finish being a judge. How uh, extensive is that program? I, I, I've never heard of that particular program. Um, so it's more my own curiosity. How many hours per month are, are, are people, our are attorneys? What we do is we this? do, I don't know if they're gonna do it this year because the county is worried about um, or maybe they'll do it without my name in it. They basically send out an email blast, the Clark County Bar, and then they, we also put a PSA in the RJ when we're looking for, for people who are willing to do it, and they can get pro bono credit for doing it. Okay. They go to the school that we have a family advocate that works on different school uh, at, at different campuses. They're all bilingual because we have a lot of Hispanics that they don't even have a word for truancy in Spanish. It's basically hooky is machismo, so it's a, it's a difficult cultural um, gap. And so it's helpful for the lawyers to learn that the idea is focus on the positive. We, we run it with a therapeutic problem solving approach. It's called a specialty court, where um, they're, if even they go from a D to a C, that's the first thing you focus on. Even if they have tardies or more absences, wow, you're really doing well here. You find out more about the child and what turns them on and, and try to get them uh, re-engaged in their, in, their, um, in their learning. And at the same time, where do they see themselves in the future? Do they play an instrument? They kind of attach to that authority figure. In many homes, you don't have a parent who gives you that kind of feedback. So they bond with these judges, even though they're lawyers, they wear the, wear the robe so the kids think that they're judges. But I'd like to be in every single school, honestly, because there isn't a school that doesn't have a truancy problem. And, and it's probably the program I'm most proud of other than the Dependency Mother Stroke Court. That's a federal grant that takes millions of dollars. So this is people volunteering, which I think is amazing. They step up to the plate, even when there was no money and we were so afraid we were gonna lose this program, but more people stepped up during that recession period than ever before. It's almost like when things are hard, people will come out and you know, if you let them know what's going on with this and kids that are really falling between the cracks and ending up in the juvenile system later, we can help them at that level now. So I look at that as an important thing that I'm doing and, and continue to do. We have no jurisdiction. We just work with CCSD. There's no truancy court anymore because the district attorney lost 19 people and could not file petitions. So we keep the diversion program going on the campuses and, and we partner with CCSD for that and the lawyers in the community. Mary, assuming you're elected, what, uh, for lack of a better term, social outreach programs would you like to see instituted or perhaps would you spearhead, uh, assuming you do rise to the bench? Well, I am like uh, Jennifer Elliott, I do like the truancy court and reaching out to the children because if you can reach out to the children and get them before they cross that line and become felons, then you may be able to send them to another you know, way of life. Uh, you know, with me being a veteran, I also believe that, you know, probably pushing, you know, going into the military to a lot of your inner city students, because a lot of people don't realize that 
there is a way out. You know, it may not be the student loans. You don't necessarily have to go out there and go into debt to better yourself. You can join the military, get some training, get out of that inner city, start getting some money, and they help you get your education while you're on active duty. So I, you know, I would like to, you know, be a little bit more active in the inner city portion because with me having been, you know, born and raised pretty much in, in, you know, below the poverty line, I know what it's like and I know that you've got to, you, you've got to take responsibility for your own life and these kids need to know it can be done and I am a perfect example of someone who, who has done it and I'm, I understand. Uh, you know, I've, I've been talking about six hours straight, more or less. Does anyone else have any questions? I'm yeah. still writing. <laughs> still taking your notes? <laughs> Believe me. That thing, when you uh, won't that, remember, that thing I will very, remember very, for you. Got a question. I think it's a very stupid, but a basic question is, why do you want to be a judge? As, as an attorney, it is a natural progression. Uh, all my life, I have I have been raised where you you do a good job and you're going to get increased responsibilities and you know be able to increase in the stature and move up in the world. Being military, you know, you've got to increase your rank. You've got to go out there. You've got to do good because increasing rank will increase your paycheck. The uh, I, I don't know if becoming a judge will increase my paycheck, lower my paycheck. It will be a lot more steadier than me trying to bring in my own clients. It stops me from having to argue every case. I can sit back and listen to everybody else argue. Uh, you know, it's it's stressful. You know, doing all the pro bono cases that I do, because uh, it's like for every paying case I do, I probably do two pro bono cases, and and so you know, becoming a judge is just that natural progression. You know, at my age, I need to start looking at okay, now what else am I going to do to improve my life? And being a judge is it. So why do you do it? I never wanted to be a judge. I never even uh, considered it. And I was working as a neutral uh, Supreme Court settlement judge, mediator, custody evaluator, uh, doing counseling, cooperative parenting after divorce at a place called Peace Talk. And I worked a lot for the family court. I was getting a lot of families coming in looking more tattered from the conflict that was created in the adversary system than they would have been if they would have been able to mediate or try some kind of alternative dispute resolution prior to spending a bunch of money, you know, go, trying to get through the adversary system. So I thought, you know, I have a lot of good ideas about court improvement. They're sending these cases to me with the program that I had was cooperative par parenting after divorce. No one else was doing that. So I actually brought that to um, the court system when I did run. So court improvement was the reason why I run, why I ran, and I had to learn the job very fast, and it was very intense. I think we had lunch maybe ten times in the first six years because of the number of cases that we had, but eight to nine thousand cases each, and eight to nine hundred open at any one time, crazy, and no active way of, of checking how long things have been open. We, when I first was there, we had nothing on the computer. It was all these giant files, so you can be there with buckets upon buckets, you know. Now it's much it's much better in terms of um, advancements with technology and I really love the real-time case management report because it lets you see exactly what's going on. So you can address the problem immediately and not wait for people to file motions and get before you. Thank you. Thank you. I actually haven't had that question asked. It's a good well, one. It is. <laughs> I guess we all just take it for well, people in my position take it for granted. It is a natural. It's like, how, you know, how quickly can I Peter Principal here? You know, well, where else can I go? Your, Please. Your real time case management reform. It's called yeah. real case it's, management, right? Real time it's case the, management. It's called the Family Court Case Activity Report. Okay. But it, it is in real time. So if something's filed, it immediately updates okay. itself. Are the other judges? in the uh, family court doing this? Everybody has, their, everybody has the ability to do it. But they don't. No, I don't know they if they do. do. I'm saying I don't, I don't we, we are so busy that we, we, it's not like we hang out together. And everybody right. is running their, their uh, department and it takes up so much time that it's hard other than judges meetings when we compare notes and talk about you know, the issues, how we're going to resolve something, what policies should we have on this issue. Um, mm -hmm. I believe several judges are, but like I said earlier, our caseload open, mm -hmm. it runs between 340 up to right. 640. 
So I but think they using have the it, tool to use it. Yeah, they okay. have the ability to. And, and not even just the judge. I mean, you can train your law clerk and your judicial executive assistant when there's extra time, which there isn't a lot of it. But, you know, hey, take a look at that and see if there's something we can close or give a call to somebody and let them know this has to happen next or there's no jurisdiction or, you know what I mean? There's yeah. just a lot of crazy problems that you can see. And if you wait for them to get before you, they may never. And they'll just be open on your docket for years, no, making it look like, you know, it, the, the best thing is to get your caseload down so that you know that you're serving right. the public. And it takes over 30 days, basically, after you file a motion for the time to pass for notice and opportunity for both sides ever since they changed the law to anything under 11 days has to be only judicial days. Your due course has to be over 30 days. And mine's always somewhere between 45 and 60, and I sign a lot of orders shortening time to get people in quicker if they're not seeing their kids or you've got a property issue with injunction requests or you know abuse neglect those kinds of things okay. well we are actually right up at our, our time amount we went a little bit over but we go a little bit over that's why we run about you know five ten minutes late every time so again i really appreciate you guys coming down today